All right, everyone, we're going to get started. So it's great to see so many familiar faces here. I'm James Delatry. I'm AVP for Research and Director of the Office of Entrepreneurship and Commercialization, and we are uh, very pleased to have JT Marino here with us tonight. Um, I wanted to say uh, a few words of thanks before we get started. I wanted to first thank some of the folks that were really instrumental in um, making Startup Week happen this year. So uh, Derek Gross and uh, Ashu Kumar, our faculty co-chair from Penn State Beaver, uh, thank you so much. And of course, our um, event superstar, Amy Pollack. Thank you, Amy. There she is over there for everything you've done to, to pull together Startup Week. Anyone who's on our volunteer committee for Startup Week, raise your hand. I, I see you, Ashley. You should be raising your hand. Yep. So, so thank you all. Um, of course, we want to thank PNC Bank. They are fantastic supporters of uh, Invent Penn State and many other initiatives across the university. So thank you to them. Uh, the Happy Valley Launchbox staff, of course, um, and the many volunteers, moderators, and speakers that have joined us. So, so thank you all. It takes a ton of effort to pull off something like Startup Week. So thank you. Um, I also want to remind a couple folks about the program the rest of this evening. So at 7.15, uh, Professor Jeanette Miller, who's the director of the Corporate Innovation and Entrepreneurship major in SMEAL, uh, will be leading a panel of um, superstars around entrepreneurship uh, benefits of our world. So um, thank you to, to Jeanette for um, organizing that panel. And then at 8.15, we have a mi mini challenge where um, we're going to ask students that are interested in further engaging in some workshop type uh, environment that's gonna test your entrepreneurial thinking. Um, there's a mini challenge uh, in the Happy Valley launch box down on the second floor that um, will allow students to think through how they might better engage and learn about all the resources that support entrepreneurship across the university. And uh, there's a $100 prize for the best uh, result of that workshop. So. Um, you know, please uh, uh, check that out after we're, we're done with this program. So uh, tonight, uh, we welcome JT Marino. He's co-founder of Tufton Needle and chief disruption officer of Serta Simmons Bedding. So JT is a passionate storyteller, facilitator, and teacher who's been instrumental in redefining the sleep industry and retail experience through Tufton Needle's rapid national expansion, award-winning company culture, evolving product offerings and acclaimed advertising campaigns. With $6,000 of personal investment in 2012, JT and his business partner, Penn State alum uh, Dehi Park, uh, have grown tough the needle to over a million dollars in their first full year of business to over $200 million in annual revenues in less than six years. So that's incredible growth uh, by, by any measure. So as Chief Disruption Officer, JT is now reinventing retail as we know it, um, through a true omni-channel clicks to bricks experiences for consumers. So JT has been featured in USA Today, Entrepreneur Magazine, Forbes. Uh, he's spoken at South by Southwest, uh, Startup Grind, and he's been named to the Recode 100, uh, Arizona Republic's 35 Under 35, and he received Etail West Visionary of the Year Award, which is awesome. Uh, JT studied computer science and mathematics at Penn State. Uh, we're also excited to share that JT will be in State College for the entire month of April. Uh, he's uh, agreed to be our entrepreneur in residence and will be meeting with dozens of classes, uh, providing consulting with startups and leadership on how to grow our entrepreneurial ecosystem. And he'll also be speaking at the Invent Penn State Venture and IP Conference on April 29th. So long introduction, but thank you, JT. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? All right. All right, awesome. So. Um, one thing that I wanted to, to um, start with is we really want this to become a conversation. So I'm going to be asking for questions. So start thinking about your corporate innovation questions. Start thinking about your startup-related questions. Um, that story of growth where JT went from a $6,000 investment to, to huge revenues, that was bootstrapping. So questions there as well. So, but I'll start with the first one uh, and uh, ask you a little bit about entrepreneurship at a young age. Did you see signs as a youngster that this was something of interest to you? Because we're often curious about whether or not folks are hardwired 
to be entrepreneurial? Um, well, I, I think my earliest memory was in fourth grade. I don't know if this is like a Pennsylvania thing, but when in fourth grade we did this car wash, it was like an economics class, but it was, you know, a car wash. And we also had some play money that we were tracking like stocks. And I loved that class like so much. And then also um, I was very competitive with like the fundraisers whenever every year when we do fundraisers. Um, mm -hmm. My mom would like take me to like businesses and then like neighborhood to neighborhood. I don't know if schools still do that, but that was like something else that was pretty big for me. So I think primarily those things um, in high school, I was, I mean, this may not be that impressive now, but um, at the time um, I was really into building computers and now I think mm -hmm. it's a very common thing, but um, so I built computers and um, you know, would, would build them and sell them to, to uh, friends and family members and all that. So I think, you know, as far as signs early on, I sold my parents' car also in fifth grade to my bus driver. So it was like <laughs> with, with their permission, like, or uh, well, they had just put it like you know out in the in the driveway with a sign, and then like yeah. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> so did that interest continue when you got to Penn State? Uh, and and uh, what was the entrepreneurial ecosystem like here at the, at the time you were a student? Yeah, I did continue. I actually had dropped the school couple uh, dro dropped out of school a couple times for some attempts but um, yeah what was really interesting was I was uh, I was in the college of engineering and I was sharing some of the projects I was working on like startup concepts myself which is when I ended up finding um, you know a, a couple different uh, professors that were involved with the entrepreneur like this um, starting entrepreneurship um, program and what was really amazing was uh, the, the um, engineering school and the Smeal school built a syllabus around the project I was building, which was like so cool. So the project I was, you know, all my, we set milestones from an engineering perspective and business plan and milestones from a business perspective. And so it was counting towards my credit and, um, and then between that and then just getting some advising and connected with like the, you know, the IP attorneys on, on campus and all that. It was honestly just that, um, having the school support it was really fulfilling for me um even you know just having anybody support like your i this 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 um urge to to build something that you're interested in which then led me to meeting my co-founder um because he was in a similar program here so how did the two of you identify the sleep industry as one that was ripe for disruption and kind of how did, how did that part of your journey start? So um, it is weird. It's still weird for me to think that I'm in the mattress industry or the sleep sleep industry um, because my background is technology and software. Um, but I, I think it's really, I would say the way that we got into it is heavily linked to what I um, I believe is um, a, a common denominator with a lot of success, successful startups um, that I've seen and that is solving a problem or some some sort of pain of your own and so this is how i explain we jumped from technology into mattresses because um, when dehi and i decided we wanted to leave the company the startup we were in in silicon valley um, the way that we sort of stepped back and we didn't like have the idea first and decide we wanted to leave our jobs we literally knew like we're confident we could find something so we spent a few weeks just thinking through and rather than trying to think of ideas that were neat or cool or trying to find inspiration for like what's being done out out there um, and what we were seeing we sort of um, similar I would say to first principles but we sat back and just started writing out um, everything that's been painful or a pain in our 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 butts um, in our own lives and so um, between our two lists we were going through them and one of the one of the items on my list was shopping for mattresses and it was sort of a joke because it's like so different and off the wall like it's it's eccentric in a weird way even though it's like um, sort of a boring or sleepy industry and um, so it, it was sort of the running joke so as we were like spending time thinking about these and, and sharing our notes so we what we ended up doing is we picked five of these problems and uh, what we just like again for sort of a joke we decided to, to go with mattresses but the thing that um, gave us conf some confidence was, it, and when I mean by a joke, it's just like that we would definitely never do this. Um, but let's just try it because both of us have had like s such like pain with like shopping for mattresses, and that led to the test that we ended up we ended up running, and that test that validated, which then led us to 
you know, to, to diving into a completely new and different market. Tell us a little more about that test. And then also, I think the company's pretty famous for iterating on its products. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about iterative design and how um, getting customer feedback helped shape the ultimate um, you know, product that you launched? So what we did was, okay, so I went, I'm not gonna go into the whole, the whole side story, but I went shopping for a mattress and it was a huge pain. And, uh, and so that's how it ended up in this list. He's like, I also have struck, like um, had a very painful experience in shopping for, for a mattress too. So f the, what we did for our different concepts or these different problems was uh, just broke them down. This isn't like definitely not rocket science. We just, um, we did something we call the hate list. So we wrote the hate list at the top of a piece of paper and we wrote down, okay, you don't like shopping for mattresses, what, what about it? And so we just wrote down everything that was painful. So you have to go into a store, like uh, it's very difficult to find information. Like how do you cross compare like, you know, with a computer it'd be like memory speed, screen resolution, like what's the screen resolution, memory speed and all of that storage on like a, a mattress, what are the metrics that you compare? Um, the makes and models were not consistent, um, you know, and it's like, I, who, wh who knows what firmness they, they, mm -hmm. they like? How do you even know what firmness your mattress is? Is it soft? Do you think that's soft? Like relative to what? So it's very difficult to even figure out what it is you're looking for and on and on and on. So, so we like wrote out all of those things and it was like a full um, length of a page, page of paper line down the center and just what we would do instead. So like if we were to wave a magic wand, like what would we... Uh, like, like what would we do if we were going to invent a, a mattress company out of thin air? And then what we did was from there, because obviously we, if we were going to start a company, we wouldn't be able to start with all of those fixes. We, we used just the criteria of what are the least of these that we would need to, to solve that are the easiest and least amount of them that um, we could uh, convince somebody and to justify buying from a brand they've never heard of and from a you know, a, a company sight unseen, like a mattress, a product sight unseen. And so we reduced that list. So what we felt in our guts was like, okay, if we did these, somebody might consider us maybe an early adopter. From there, we just converted that into a single page website. Um, we hooked up a, um, a credit card processing form that would authorize but not capture a fund. And then we purchased a photo stock image of a mattress, put that at the top. And so all of these sort of things that we, features we were, the, sort of the MVP, I, I guess um, you could say, we translated in the sales, but this is like totally a facade. It's like totally fake. And so we launched this, um, we launched the site. Um, I'm sitting in a cafe, Dehi wasn't with me. And so I'm like, okay, the site's up. And then he messaged me and said, all right, I just took out an ad. So we did a Google ad. And then within 15 minutes, he's calling me, screaming, screaming at me over the phone that we just made a sale. and. <laughs> So somebody was like hammering the processing button. And so that was like, we did, a, we did a few other tests with other concepts and two other ones did pass, but nothing like this is fast. And so it really was, it, it, it was just validating that, all right, it's not just us that has this problem. Um, and the fact that you can run an ad and get a stranger to like attempt is like an, a validation in and of itself. So that's really like how we did that test. So that's when we, had to dive in and figure out like, how do you even make a mattress? You know, and it's still like you, you know, okay, so there's something here, but you still have to figure out how to do it. So the, the test was in June of 2012. And then from June to October, we f just figured out like, how does the supply chain work? What are the materials? Like who makes them? Can you put them in a box? Like stuff like that, um, which, for us is very different because instead of a digital product, this is tangible, it's a tangible good. And instead of like being able to build a rapid prototype of software over, the, over a few days, this took like months. So it's like a really slow, painful process, like any tangible good for the most part. So anyway, in October is when we launched and we did bootstrap. We bootstrapped completely like to like the whole way. We, we secured some debt, but it was a very small percentage of our revenues. Um, so what I mean is like we literally put $6,000 into an account. We had uh, definitely some extra to float our own cost of living, um, but we did scale up to $250 million in annual revenue profitably the whole way. I mean, we had to be profitable the whole way, otherwise we'd be bankrupt. So um, until we did the merger with Serta Simmons. But um, the reason I'm, I'm saying this at this point in time and with regards to your question is that um, we didn't have any money to really spend. Six grand is not much um, when you have to buy materials and 
um, pay for some basic, basic advertising, just a little bit for testing. So we basically had no money for advertising. So you can imagine two co-founders who were like, like strapped for cash personally, we're living off our savings with very little money in the bank. So what do you, what do you do? Like, how do you grow this thing? And so that's like really hard. <laughs> so we had to basically do everything ourselves for the first six months or seven months. But um, so we had to really rely on like getting the word out about our company without dollars. So we had to, you know, try to figure out how to get exposure um, on online um, through like seeking feedback. Um, Reddit was like a huge help for us because we tapped into some communities and asked them questions and got feedback and all that, which like spurred some people taking a chance and, and, and buying from us. And so it's like those super few customers you get in the very beginning that you want to like do anything that you can to learn from their experience and also to blow their minds if you can. And so what we did was every single customer we got, we would ask them, what was it you liked about the mattress? We would call them like every single customer was called. I called them and ask them, what did you like? You know, what was painful? And so we would use that as a, as an input to what do we need to fix with, we treat everything like a product. So the product is a product, the shipping, the pricing, the, the customer service, I mean, he did the customer service, um, for the first like six months till we hired our brothers, our website and, and on and on. And so, and then what happened was because we started that early, once as we started to grow, our, well, first off, our customers, the satisfaction started rising, and then they started sharing with their friends, and then their friends shared with their friends, and because they were they were so blown away, it was easier for them to like talk about. It became evangelists, really. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. And then it was very slow, but it started to compound like over the course of about a year. And so um, from from that point, I would also say it was a huge benefit to us because as we started hiring people, that process was already built. And so, and it turned into like, we would have company, company meeting month, month to month, like reviewing our net promoter score. That's mm -hmm. the system we ended up converting our feedback collection to. And we basically study the, the detractors. We study all the problems. We, the promoters and the people, the things people love about your brand, what we use that in our advertising. Like if somebody's like customer service is amazing, like this is like game changing. Okay, so how, we, how can we make sure everybody gets that experience? But it was more so the gems are the problems. And when you fix those problems, then like small, medium sized problems become big problems. And then you keep doing this and then your satisfaction rises and your customers literally become your salespeople. Mm -hmm. So the first three years was completely organic, which then also drove our costs down, which we were already cash strapped. So that allowed us to um, outperform our competition once our competitors started spinning up and keep our costs low and, and stay profitable. So it really is part of like the the ethos and um, I would say just like the heartbeat of our company. Well, and that's a real contrast to some conventional wisdom in Silicon Valley where you raise a bunch of venture capital, maybe do a Super Bowl ad or something, right? And then, you know, hope that that's how you, you ultimately uh, develop your sales, right? So that's a mm -hmm. unique. I want to talk a little bit about growing not in Silicon Valley and the rationale that led for you all to invest in Phoenix and um, kind of the benefits of being in a smaller market. I, we've got some entrepreneurs in the, in the uh, room here. I think they see some of the benefits of being in a smaller smaller market. Can you talk a little bit about you know the difference sure. between Silicon Valley and, and Phoenix? Yeah, so it was like very, like the, the primary reasons we decided to leave Silicon Valley um, ended up expanding and as we moved and realized like all the extra benefits, things we didn't even think about, but it was very logical. Firstly, try to convince somebody to join a mattress company in Silicon Valley. So it's, it's like the talent was either a co-founder in their own startup or had golden handcuffs of like one of the Fang, Fang companies. So, so that was a huge challenge. And also it's just like, it was like the most ridiculous idea anybody's ever heard of to start a, a tech slash mattress company. So now it isn't, but in the very beginning it was. There wasn't all these other, you know, it wasn't cool yet. So that mixed with, it was so expensive, just our own cost of living, rent and groceries and all of that. Um, office space, so if we wanted a small office, you're looking at five to $10,000 a month, which we couldn't afford. So it was very much that, the I would say sort of the um, intangible or um, indirect reasons we wanted to leave was that it's definitely a bubble in the sense that everybody thinks that it's all about the valuation and their product it seems like their main product is stock and their their shares and their value rather than the actual product itself 
and that you know create buzz and flip it to the next investor. And that wasn't a, some, a game we wanted to play because we wanted to bootstrap. And so it seemed like, oh, you're not really a startup if you're bootstrapping. Um, you know, the mentality's changed a little bit since then, but also like try getting press, try having somebody join. Like it's very difficult when people are like, "What's your valuation? What are the val what are the credibility markers that you're legit and whatever? Who's your VC?" So just sort of like to relate this, Warren Buffett talks about this and why he's not in New York, you know, and why he's in why he's in you know Nebraska and why he thinks about his investments when he's getting his haircut and rather than talking to like you know, finance like professionals. So anyway, like that was another reason why we wanted to get out was that we wanted to build a different kind of company. So once we get to Phoenix, then we realize like Phoenix is actually one of the top 10 sources of talent, tech talent in the Silicon Valley. Um, we also uh, learned that it was, you know, it's the fifth largest city by population. It's massive. And it's very like the, the, um, the culture of Phoenix is people really care about their lifestyles and their families. And so rather than like mercenary jump and hop from startup to startup, so they're looking for something more longer term that they can align to. So, you know, when things are tough, like we're not like people are bailing, like looking for the next startup. Um, so we found that there was an alignment with the type of company we were building and the people and just the community itself is very supportive because Phoenix wants to be, you know, an important city and also um, they want to be sort of like entrepreneurship is huge in, in Phoenix, but Phoenix wasn't the only city we were looking at. We just thought this would be good. I mean, we, c I, I can call the mayor, I can call the governor, they answer calls and the city has been super helpful in getting like, um, through the red tape when we're building something and needing their approvals. And it's just like, it's very supportive. We're not, we're not being lost in the noise. You know, maybe that'll change over time, but that was the primary reason. And it was like massive for, for us. I think it was like probably one of the critical decisions that led to our, led to Tough Needle being able to be bootstrapped. So I'm gonna ask one more question and then we're gonna open it up for some questions around the room. So start thinking, okay? So um, the, the culture you described at Tough to Needle is one that, as I said at the outset, uh, has won some awards. Um, I was really taken by your school fundraising program and how you've been able to weave philanthropy into Tough to Needle and it had over 500 different communities uh, that were benefiting from the, the fundraising approach that you developed there. Can you talk a little bit about that? And, and is that something that came from ideas like that, which are very clever? Did that come from the, uh, your staff? Was that something that, um, w w had you seen other models similar to that? We hadn't seen other models. Um, I'm not big on like whose idea what it was. It was, I would say it was the, it was the group. It was mm -hmm. the, the um, it was a group effort, but this this program that um, we're talking about is we so back to fundraisers at schools when I was like, you know, selling um, cookie dough or wrapping paper or cookies or whatever it was um, going neighborhood to neighborhood, uh, you know, trying to raise money for whatever the cause is at the school. Um, what we did was we built a, this program where a, a, a um, elementary school can sign up, any school really can sign up. And then we just basically give them a special code and all the collateral that they can hand out to students and their families. And if they buy a mattress or somebody buys a mattress, they recommend somebody buys a mattress and they use that link, then we donate a percentage of the profit to that school. And so it's actually really profitable. So they it blows away like when they're, you know, selling wrapping paper or whatever. And then also kids don't have to go door to door. To door. They can do it amongst their digital families. And also like if a family is moving or they need a mattress, they buy it. We're basically donating. I, I, I want to say it's all the profit. If it's, if it's not, it's a huge portion of all the profit to that school. So um, we, yeah, so that, that was a, that was a big thing for us just to give back to the community. Um, you know, I would say, so that's, that's one aspect. Another is we donate all of our returns which was something that we innovated. So we, when we had our first return, like, so we're very pragmatic. So rather than trying to, okay, so here's another thing I would like, I, I, I'm not like keen on advising, but this is something I think I, is, is like probably would apply to most startups is that if you try to solve like all the problems up front, like you'll never start. So one of the things we were debating day he wanted, day he wanted to figure out like, how are we gonna do a return? Like this mattress, we figured out how to get into a small box or we're one of the first companies to do that. And then, but what happens if somebody takes it out and then it expands, like how do you get it back in the box? 
And also it's huge. It's not like a small thing. So like, it's not going to necessarily fit in people's cars. I mean, some people have trucks, but, but like, what do you do in the situation? And I was adamant that we would be um, pragmatic and like, let's just wait till the first person calls and then we'll figure it out. So we would do this. Like we kick some of these like things you think you need to have figured out beforehand off. And you could do that when you're small, when you're bigger, like it's harder to do that. So anyway, the bar is definitely higher when you're larger. But um, we got our first call, a person tried to do a return, and we, we couldn't figure it out. They, they ended up calling us, we said, well, take it to the UPS store. So I take it to the UPS store, and they're like, okay, they're, they're helping me get this into like a box. They're cutting this custom box, this is a customer. And they're like, and it's gonna be $600, which is like more than the cost of the mattress, and also the shipping. So we're definitely like losing a lot of money on this, uh, doing it this way, so this is not gonna work. So we're like, all right, if we don't figure this out, this whole thing is just like, it's, it's crashed and burnt. So, um, so we were like banging our heads against the wall and then we had this idea to maybe work with like a charity. Like maybe there are charities and sort of like Goodwill could take it and do something and sell it or, or donate it. We did an experiment with um, child services um, that did work, but it was so much work to coordinate because you can't meet direct with the family. So the child services has to like be an intermediary and we can donate and they can give it to the family that needs it. So we started that in Phoenix, but how do you scale that to every city? Um, what ended up happening was Vincent de Paul was the only charity that would do this. And they said, oh, we'll go and pick it up for you. So the next person who called Vincent de Paul went and did it. This started to grow and then other like charities, national and local charities, started to accept mattresses following their lead. And now we have a database. So you just type in a zip code in our database and it's like, here's all the local ones that'll go and pick it up. Here are the national ones you can fall back to. In worst case, we were the first mattress company to establish a relationship with 1-800-GOT-JUNK and they'll just go pick it up and recycle it. So that was our awesome. process. And so we were able to do community good while also solving a big problem, which is like, what do you do with these big things that need to be returned? Awesome, awesome. Questions? Benjamin. Uh, we hear that software is eating the world a lot, or at least have been hearing that for a number of years. Uh, what do you think the future of physical products looks like based on your experience? The physical a future uh, physical products in the mattress industry or overall? But just in general. Okay, so my idea on this is like very radical. So um, I think that the digital world will also eat furniture. So I think that furniture will disappear. So I think that um, <laughs> maybe this is like too extreme, but I think that like if you ever seen like read the book like Ready Ready Player One or seen the movie, so those like comfortable chairs you're using to tap into the VR. I think that um, you know our apartments are going to get really small, and we're going to have like this chair that you can like lay back and sleep in and sit up and like tap into your VR and maybe only only need to get up to go to the bathroom and that's sort of like it. And then it's going to be the hipsters and like the old school kids who like listening to records that have furniture and like to play board games and go bowling. So I think it's ma the majority of it. I think software is going to, as people like dive into the rabbit hole of like digital consciousness into like the VR world, it's gonna sort of like make furniture and then all, like I'm using furniture as an example, but like what else would you use in the physical world that you probably don't need to if you're playing you know video games or living in a digital world all day? I don't know if that's like crazy, too crazy, but. Lee. Yeah, we've got to go look at the song in the year, in the year 2525, because it predicted that. Um, uh, question, so you met your co-founder here, right? Mm -hmm. And so I know we, have a, we work with a lot of young startups. How in the world do you figure out if this is the person you want to basically link your life to? And I, I often tell people that it's sometimes harder to divorce your business partner than it is your spouse, right? Yeah. <laughs> so how, do you, how did you go back figuring that out? And what advice would you give people for, for trying to do that? That was like, Dehi and I was like obvious chemistry. So as soon as we met, we were talking like we were brothers. So I think I was just lucky there. Um, I don't know if all co-founders have that experience. Um, I've only started one company like with a co-founder. So that was just like my situation. But we were like, you know, we were attached at the hip while we were both like our time at Penn State were overlapped. So we were... Um, I was teaching him how to code. He was teaching me how to do marketing and we were just headed off. And I think our personalities, like our, you know, Myers-Briggs and just how our dynamic, like my wife's personality is like almost identical today. He's like, he's very calm and, um, you know, I'm very lively and we just like don't, don't argue. 
Um, I would say also that, you know, we have had a couple rough patches, um, but overall, like we still, we're still friends and have a good relationship. So like a marriage, like it's super important to be communicating all the time. And it's really easy once you get busy to forget to. So we started communicating a lot. And then when we would stop like hanging out or stop like putting in the energy to work things out, um, that's when problems arise. And I would also say like having some method to mediate, even if you think you'll never need to. Like having, even if it's like a, a board of you, your co-founder and a tiebreaker, um, so that if there ever is an issue, your company doesn't dissolve. Um, Cause that's what happens in stalemates for some structures. So you want to have somebody who can just make the decision and that's that. So that was something we ended up learning and we ended up setting up when we were having a rough patch. It's always good to set that kind of stuff up when things are good, not when things are bad and you're having trouble. So, yeah. Other questions? Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about product iteration um, for expensive uh, products, or did you have to deal with minimum order quantities, and how did you iterate? So, uh, well, minimum order quantities we had to get around because of bootstrapping, so, and we didn't have like any credit for like a bank because we're like a startup. Um, so what we, we basically went from factory to factory. I rented a car and went like, drove to the factories, like up and down the East Coast, West Coast, and even would, some of these, like the mattress industry is so weird. I don't know if other industrial park sort of manufacturers are like this too, but in order to like get to them, sometimes they don't answer their phones. You have to like go in the back door through where the trailers like pull up and find a salesperson. But we ended up finding a supplier who was like, we wouldn't have been like, um, you know, well, we would have been a small fish, but they didn't have huge fishes in their manufacturer. So it was a small, like, mom and pop shop that did furniture who wanted to get into mattress making. And we worked out a deal where they would make, you know, they'd produce as we as we sold them. So um, that was that was a part. What was the other part of your question? Oh, okay. How do we iterate? Okay. So, well, it's also a lot easier in the beginning. So um, I just like slept, um, there were actually a few nights slept at the factory, but we got a hotel room, I got a hotel room, and I just sat like really close to the factory. And so as we didn't need to make a change, we'd go in and just make that little tweak. It's definitely harder like once you're, once you have a lot of inventory to make a change, that especially that's aesthetic, where you have to up, update the website and the visuals and then people get a product that looks different. But, um, but I mean like to give you an example, like we would, we, here, here's sort of an extreme one. So we would have people have mold on their mattresses. And I'm like, we're freaking out. Like, why is this happening? And we found that it was on the bottom. And then we found that a lot of people put their mattress on the floor. And a lot of people have wood floors and, and there's in and, and humid environments. We're like, is this a problem? Some other mattress companies actually had this problem. They haven't solved it. So then we like dove in. We worked with the manufacturer, called on like fabric suppliers. And we found spacer fabric, which is the the meshy stuff that's like on the back of backpacks and the straps. And we're like, could we put this on the bottom of a mattress? So we made some prototypes on the, on site, which only take a few days with like cut and sew. And then we just updated it. And then all of those sort of issues like resolved themselves because air could flow. So it was everything from like that to like dialing in the different variables of like the foams and eventually um, finding a chemist to develop some of our own polymers for our own like truly unique foams. Um, but like it was really just I, I want to say, like, I, maybe this is just me, but I was just paranoid that somebody was upset with us or somebody would want to return and sort of embarrassing. So that sort of like fear of failing or fear of um, some, you know, trying to avoid somebody upset drove us to like wanting to fix everything we could. So within reason, because we only had, I mean, within our first, within our first year, um, we had our, our two brothers who we paid. That was another thing. It's another way we bootstrapped. We didn't pay them anything um, for like the first three months, but they wanted to work with their brother, so it was fine. We paid them back. Um, but then, yeah, first first year we had we grew to about six people. So and then once we had more people, we, we all kind of worked together on that. I don't know if that answers your question. Other questions? Um, yeah. So a really interesting talk. Thank you. Um, I was wondering about competition. So. Um, when someone comes in and tries to copycat your idea, how did you handle that? And do you have any tips for people going forward? Okay, so um, this has been something that we've worked really hard to try to like make sure the record is straight um, because our, some of our competitors have tried to like change history with it when they get press and when they write. Um, we are the first like bed in a box, D to C, simple, one mattress, like, and um, 
after our second year, once we started to get noticed and then the VC started to notice us and we're like, wait, you're a startup. Wait, this is a space we can invest in. And then money started like flowing in um, was when our first competitor started. And we heard that this this company was coming. And it's one you probably have definitely heard of this based in New York. And it was just like huge amount of fear and a pit in our stomach. I mean, this is, a, this is my first company and it's also, it would be our first direct competitor. The big companies were already sleepy. Like there, it was obvious that they weren't taking care of customers. They're, they're a lazy company. So we weren't really worried that they would beat us to um, our features and the things that we were doing. It would take them a while, which a lot of them have updated since. But anyways, um, once this competitor came in, we're like, okay, they're, they're gonna probably raise money and they did. And they ended up raising a lot of money. We're like, we're dead. Totally dead. They're going to raise the cost of advertising and all that. So what, what we ended up doing um, over time, so I just kind of jumped to a couple big things we learned. One, we learned that our fear usually was like uh, irrational. So whenever they'd raise and then, you know, first their, their seed was uh, half a million dollars and they're immediately within a few weeks of launching, raise another million and a half and then zoom forward three years, they raised 50 million. Now they're like half a billion. And every time they'd go to raise, we're like, here it comes, like we're not gonna be able to survive and then give it a few months and nothing really changes and we're still growing. Um, so it always seemed to be a little irrational. Um, another thing that validated was every year we did go out to raise just to see, just so we weren't like with our heads in the sand, um, not considering all of our options. And we always struggled to, when we were asked how much we're raising to figure out how much we needed because we never really could find like, we couldn't really see anything that we'd want to spend money on um, because of the way we operated. We couldn't figure out like what would we use the money for. So we thought, okay, well, if we're backing into this, how are they even spending? Um, you know, later on, once we realized we're like, you know, 30 or $40 million, you know, in the red every year, we're like, all right. So um, another thing we learned is that we can't play the game the same way. Like if they're going to do a New York City subway takeover, oh, we need to do that too. What if they get exclusivity and, we can, and they cut us out? You know, whenever we get the pricing on the subway, then we'd find like we couldn't probably couldn't afford this or prove that it was actually profitable. And then we realized that like, we really can't play the game the same way as them. So we had to play completely different. So we just wanted to make sure. So so then now in hindsight, like after, you know, all these other we have like 200 competitors, a lot of those have fallen away. What we what we realized was that it well, I'll, let me just say this. If I was going to start a company like this again, I would do my best to spur competition because, and especially spur VC capital to go in, because um, as long as you're making sure you're part of the narrative and you're, as far as the customer journey, they'll find you at some point, their dollars, like for every dollar, like this particular competitor I'm thinking of is spend, I did a calculation, for every dollar they spend, 30 cents is, is ours. So we allowed them to do all the advertising for us. So they became part of our marketing engine. So um, I don't think there we would have um, come nearly like our, our our acceleration our growth wouldn't wouldn't be nearly what it was if it wasn't for all of the venture capital and the and that was flowing in and all these other startups and I would just say like so then what do you do if they're copying you you just have to keep changing so they copy an ad or they copy or even use graphics from your own website fine so like make a better graphic and like let them use your old stuff while you're making better new stuff. And so that's what I realized. As long as you're like a year or two years ahead, like you're solid and that's sort of par for the course in probably most markets. More questions? Um, Ryan. At, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, no. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, at what point, at like revenue point, were you thinking about like, the merger and did you have shareholders that might have pressured you to actually do think of M&A versus you kind of sticking to your guns with bootstrapping and kind of doing your own thing and not not merging with Serta? So okay so uh, we had no shareholders other than my co-founder and I we own 90 percent of the company and had given 10 percent to the to the employees then we created another optional 10 percent so really it was like 20 percent employees 80 percent Dehi and I and that wasn't like our intention. We just figured we'd just keep creating and giving more away. So it was like employee owned, I would say. Um, it wasn't the shareholder pressure. What it was, was we finally figured out how to expand. Uh, we, we basically found like the holy grail for our business and, and expansion. So as your our digital growth and expansion sort of tapped out and we figured like televisions online would eventually grow to 30% of the market. Um, if let's say, at that time, we were estimating 20% of the market is like digital. And between us and our competition, we had 
we had eaten all of that all of that market share and so now we're just kind of trading percentages between our comp competitors and like lackluster competitors like who aren't performing we end up taking so if you want to like keep that accelerating for for us that that was going to be distribution so where else are customers buying from um, should we be dogmatic and not put our mattresses in places that people would want to go? Like my mom shops at Costco, and if she can buy something there as opposed to somewhere else, she would. So should we just say no, like screw like re brick and mortar, and we're not going to go into Costco and forget all of those people? Um, or should our mattress maybe be our brand be agnostic to channels? It's like where people want to buy it, they buy it from, and we change year to year. So that was sort of our perspective. Anyways, the, the holy grail was we figured out how to go into a city and do a full billboard takeover, like buying hundreds of billboards. Uh, like we, we are the top buyer of billboards in Arizona, like more than Geico and McDonald's. And so people see this and like, wow, they're burning a lot of cash. Actually, no, we're really profitable. We figured out how to measure our out of home marketing blended with digital marketing and, and um, so well that, um, and it took some iteration and like, a-B testing between cities, um, intervention analysis. So like we'd run one city and run another city and we'd change like our program and we'd figure out which program worked and then that became the new um, playbook moving forward. Anyways, so we figured out how to go into a city, do billboards, radio, television, digital, um, blended, measured, raise, uh, raise the growth in those areas like accretively to our national like growth index. And, um, and then also like, um, uh, be able to drop in a retail store and as soon as our retail store drops in it just totally ignites our online sales people don't even go in the to the store it's just like oh you have a store i'll buy it online um it's just like validation so anyways we figured it out but the problem is we're cash poor because we bootstrapped we don't have like a 50 million dollar war chest we just have the millions that we've like been saving you know for over the years and so um to do this process cost you know let's say let's say a million dollars like a to z to to get it going before and i would say it takes maybe a year to see like a, a return on that so if we have competition like growing and really spending and we only can do like one maybe two stores a year how long is it going to take before we have two or three hundred stores and, and like are actually nationally because like we're you know when we're doing several hundred million in in sales you know opening one two stores at a time is like nothing it's it's marginal so we really need to open up a lot of stores so we figured we needed 50 million dollars and then we can open up like two to five stores concurrently um, go, uh, in going into cities. And we could do this national takeover at the local level because we're already a national level. So that was sort of the idea. That then led to investors finding us and then strategics, which are like manufacturers or like other companies reaching out to us. And then that led us to this option was on the table. It wasn't something we ever wanted to do, which is like a merger, like these are the bad guys. We ended up realizing this would accelerate our growth. They have the skeleton, Serta Simmons is the skeleton key to every retail store. They're in, they're in Costco and, and Sam's. Like no, very few massive brands can even pull that off. They're everywhere. So they had the skeleton key to expand Tough the Needle. So we, our goal was to make the industry customer first. They can accelerate us to this. We want to be their size. They, their brands are declining and regressing. It's a turnaround. They want to figure out how can we get people to not confuse Serta with Sealy or Simmons, like what's the difference? People don't even know. Because the brands don't mean anything. They don't know how to build a brand. So they wanted a brand of the quality of Tough the Needle. We wanted, we wanted our brand to be of the quantity of sort of Simmons and to accelerate. And then we have this cool story of pirates raiding a ship and totally disrupting the, the incumbent from the inside and fixing it for the outside. And we, we just, so that was like, it seems counterintuitive, but when you hear it that way, it probably makes sense. But that was the why we ended up deciding to do the merger, was that it sort of became, we, it was like an organic process to arriving that this could accelerate TNN and we, we could hit our, our, you know, our mission as a company so much faster and then have a war chest if we ever need it from the big, from the big company. So, anyway. Questions? Uh, I've enjoyed your uh, presentation. Uh, the uh, bootstrapping um, concept resonates with me. Um, I'm curious about as you were growing um, your culture and how you brought people on. You, you even referenced, uh, yeah, you know, Silicon Valley who wants to work for a mattress company. Um, and so, I mean, I saw, you know, little glimpses of, 
um, what you talked about as far as giving back to the community and um, your rejects or whatever your returns were being given out. Is that part of your culture and what other aspects um, bring people to want to work at your company? Um, I would say, I would say like the philanthropy side, maybe for some people, but I wouldn't say that's like the primary driver why people wanted to work for us. So we didn't know anything like about brand. I've never built a brand. I didn't know what brand really meant. I still think, you know, I believe that most people don't understand what brand means. Um, but we've learned that over time. And brand really is culture. Like what we ended up realizing was that um, for us to build the kind of, like we, we broke down like what does our company need to be where the antithesis to the mattress industry, which is not like customer forward, it's not people forward. And so we just broke down like what are these, what are these elements like one of, the, one of the elements is kindness. So that's one of the things that, you know, it's one of our values is kindness. Another one is being honest and authentic, which is like our industry isn't honest and authentic. We started to map values to what we would need to, you know, what this, what the, if you're going to break down and, you know, a company in adjectives, what kind of company is what is needed. And that's how, sort of how we broke it down. And um, coincidentally, it sort of aligns a little bit with our personalities, my co-founder and I. So um, anyways, we end up like interviewing people based on those things. So kindness, hardworking, integrity. We also look for makers. That's really important to us because we're makers and we want to, you know, you see a problem, you go and make it. You're not like looking for some agency to outsource it to. That's not us. So. And it also like lends itself like perfectly to being iterative. You see a problem, you fix it. So we hire people who are also growth. They're also growth minded, like people who have hobbies. I view as makers as well. Like people who are like actively engaging and learning and never stopping. So, um, anyways, uh, as we started to interview, we have questions around all of this, um, trying to find people who like meet these criteria. Um, you know, we they we, they start making decisions like us. They start deciding we, I, we can have confidence to delegate and let them decide. And our brands begins. There's something like it's really good brands. Like there's something about them you can't like put your thumb on a lot of times. And definitely, you know, definitely has that. It's and what I would say is that the culture and the brand are like reflective. So they're they're synergistic. And um, and what what ended up happening was like as we've like sought to hire. Um, these specific kinds of people as we became this sort of brand where the culture and the, and the brand really were symbiotic it started to um, create inbounds so then people just started applying because it just they and a lot of customers so customers buy and they're like I love this company I don't know why I just love this company and it was like self they were self selecting themselves so our interview so it was where it was we would have like um, three days of interview, like over way overboard. Like we'd have a lunch, we'd have sometimes dinner, and we just like Dave and I would both have to meet them. And anyways, it got easier and easier. And so like our selection process, we became less and less selective because these people were like self-selecting. So I would say like it's, it started off by being like really um, considered and methodical with like who we were choosing and why we were choosing them. And then after we had sort of created a critical mass, it sort of became magnetic in drawing those types of people to us. But other than that, like the specific how, how that's working, I don't know. It just does. So the people just find us, yeah. Question. Um, well, we actually did something called the opportunity analysis, which was like a total pseudoscience. It was like a pseudo model where we were like breaking down like the different types of disruption and then like the cost of entry and the barriers to entry and all of that. And we evaluated all these different markets. Um, and Top the Needle was actually going to be abstracted to a larger brand and we were gonna dive into a few of these. We developed, we have like a full f like office furniture line. We like actually developed um, some designs for, for luggage. We designed um, cookware before a lot of these other D2C digitally native brands dove into those things. And a few others, like we've had team members leave, like patio furniture. So one, if you look high neighbor, highneighbor.com, like that's three of our team members. That one's like succeeding. Another one went into the funeral funeral industry and is doing urns and probably caskets eventually, which is like another one that we identified. I think there's a lot. Um, and I think that it always it, it, it's always like, growing so like once like we went in and we did disruption and catalyzed a lot of disruption and a lot of change but like give it 10 years and it could probably be done again so i think like it's all over the place and i don't really have any specifics to give you but um i would say this that like for us i think what what worked for us is start it was starting like to to we followed our nose like 
and got clues as to what were pains for us. But in the end, at the end of the day, you're building what people want. So you have to think of what people want, and you can start with yourself. And if you want to disrupt, you have to screw something up. So you have to make it a big problem. So you have to, whatever it is and how you're approaching it, rather than being like a slight iteration, um, it has to be some sort of serious screw up for whoever's in that business at the time, I think. So following up on the chief disruption officer, what was it like that transition from CEO and you know, low resource environment to now being part of a larger organization, the role of disruption, more resources, but probably not as agile? What was that like going from entrepreneur to intrapreneur? If you um, want to use those terms. Frustrating. Yeah. <laughs> it's frustrating. Um, you know, we being able to be in a meeting and making a decision and just going and doing it. Like you leave the meeting and you go and do the thing, you know? But now you're in a larger company and it makes sense. So one of the things, my perspective, so I have a lot of empathy now for the corporate red tape. Like I, you know, my, uh, sometimes I want to pull my hair out, um, but like I, I have empathy because you have so many people and it's so big and there are specialists and they have responsibilities and so people need to check off. So here's like a, a micro example of this was, you know, there was a point where like we, I knew everything going on in the company and I remembered when I couldn't, we created these channels in Slack uh, before Slack was hip chat, but like we had these channels called changelog. So um, we would have like pri pricing changelog, marketing changelog, product changelog, um, you know, events like internal events change log. And so like whenever something would happen, people would post, the team would post what they did, what's changed. So you can like follow what's happening and changing. And I remember when I couldn't keep up with it anymore. And I remember when somebody asked me a question, I didn't have the answer. Because there, when, when you're like 15 people in a room, you're like one brain. You know, every, everybody knows everything going on. And we're also honeymooning and we can, we're all hanging out together all the time too. But once you're like 50, 60 people, you don't know everything that's going on. And so the micro example I was going to give you is like this dynamic between um, like engineering, marketing, and, and, and um, design. And so, you know, when there was something that needed to be done, like, you know, design is working on aesthetic, but they also think they're marketers and marketers are doing their marketing and designing like the psychology of pages and conversion, but they think they're designers and then engineers are like, why aren't we a part of the process? Because this <laughs> takes so long to build. If you had included me early, then it would have been a lot easier, but also we're doing, we're just being told what to do. We want to be a part of the narrative, but they want their fingerprints on it. And then we realize, all right, so like first, who's it start with like the stakeholder and then it goes to design, but we need to make sure engineer. But anyways, what I'm getting at is like, there's so many steps to the process once, especially once your standards rise, where it's like, you need to make sure like your, your designs and everything is like on par, like not on par, but like aligned with your design and direction, your voice and the copy is aligned in that, you know, and what, what is the marketing and program and, and all of your campaigns that you're doing and like what you're launching and the product is like aligned with campaigns and like everybody is involved and it's getting more and more complex. And so you have, you have like checks and bounces and then you have like meetings and then you have red tape and then grow that to 6,000 employees. And so I get it why like it's slow and frustrating. It's just, it's just slow and frustrating. And there are ways that we can break glass, which eventually, you know, I was asked to break glass as a disruption officer. So I actually made, you know, s some people appreciated it. I made some enemies, um, but like we got a lot of things done. And you know, there's a lot of process that some of the things that needed to be built wouldn't work because those competencies weren't there um, with a larger company. Like um, say designing a product line that works agnostic of channel. Like instead of designing a product line for this store and a product line for this store, let's design a product line for consumers that works in these stores. And then how do we present like six mattresses as one so it's easy, like you know, an iPhone's like 30 phones or like a, you know, a Tesla Model S is like 60 Teslas that's all rolled into one. Like how do we combine and like cater to these stores? And so that process doesn't exist and that's not the way that, you know, decisions are made. So how do we stand up some of these, some of these ways of like doing the studies and all that? So I would just say it's, it's been very frustrating, but there is change happening, which is the validation I need to, to be motivated to continue. But, um, I would say corporate culture isn't for me as of right now in my stage of my life. So I'm likely, I mean, I actually am transitioning out and moving on, which was part of the plan. So it's been four years. So, awesome. yeah. Diallo, good to see you. <laughs> Yeah, 
so the question is, how um, were we able to maintain the culture and the values like post merger? Um, I would say, kind of. So for the first couple of years, like you know, it was going to be a walled garden. We're not going to touch your brand, and that was sort of like the deal. And um, you know, I don't think it was like a it wasn't a Zappo situation where it's a walled garden, probably contractually with Amazon. Um, so you know, they're to simplify and same systems and overlap with teams. Like we have a IT team, but we're mostly an engineering team. So we have IT. It's like two people doing IT and infrastructure, and it's everything else is in the cloud, and the engineers do it all. We have like you know, at the time of the merger, I think 30 or 25 software engineers, like engineers, true developers. And, you know, our, our um, um, new company, you know, they, there's another team there. It's IT. It's like true IT. And, you know, they have servers managing, you know, email servers in the old style. And, you know, they have probably, probably 75 people. And they have a, you know, CTO. And so we have a you know, director of engineering. And so like, how does this work? And who reports to who? Are we just going to keep separate? And are we going to be on the same email system? And we're on Gmail and they're in Outlook and we don't want to use Microsoft products. And so in the end, um, a lot has changed. And I think, honestly, um, I think it's okay because a lot of what we brought, so a lot of that essence has tran transferred over. Um, but the culture has changed, um, you know, because the, a lot of the team has changed. And some of the things that we were building or needing, we didn't need to do anymore. Like we didn't need an accounting team because they already had a lot of that process in place. And so a lot of the people just have just left. Um, the hiring process is different. But I would say as of right now, a lot of the core tenants and how we design and uh, make decisions are still, still there. So um, I, I think this is like a really complicated challenge and I don't really know how to do it. Um, I wouldn't say like we were super successful in, in like maintaining that culture. You know, it's been, I've been there um, after the merger three and a half years. Um, you know, if you asked me this question like a year and a half ago, my answer would have been pretty different, but I'm seeing it happen. So, and honestly, like some of the th technologies we're using are different and some of the things that we need to be doing in our, um, our projects are just different. And so we need different um, skill sets. And so it's just, there's churn and it needs to churn. And I'm okay with that. I think it. For, for like a, this new company, it has to it has to morph into whatever it needs to be. Well, that was a fast hour. One, one more question? One more question. Oh, okay. Yep. Yep, one more Hello. question here. Hello. Um, I just wanted to ask, what did you do for advertising in the very beginning? So in the very, very beginning, it was perform just traditional performance marketing, um, CPC. And, um, and I would say, okay, so, well, let me just say before that was we had to find traction before we were really able to afford to scale up the digital advertising. We did do digital advertising. It just wasn't like a huge part of our, our budget. Um, Dehi is, um, he's a master at um, performance marketing. And so we had a huge edge when we first started because like all of the typical mattress companies had no idea how to do any marketing. Now it's becoming like um, more democratized and um, I would say commoditize, and that and that skill set is becoming common at different companies. But uh, in the beginning, it was primarily performance marketing. Um, we we did some other things like eventually we ended up working with affiliates, which we really didn't want to because they're just a digital manifestation of like mattress salespeople. Um, but yeah, it was it was primarily that we sort of figured out Facebook, never figured out YouTube. And then eventually we figured out out of home marketing, which gave us a little bit of, of an edge over the new digi digital companies who couldn't figure it out. But I'd say that was primarily it. And then just like early, early days was we would just seek feedback from commun digital communities, like as an example, like Reddit, different subreddits, like uh, minimalism was one. Um, and there's a, there's a few others where we'd, we'd post our company. We'd say, hey, this is what we're building. Here's our website. You know, we're not trying to sneak it and try to, um, not disclose who we are and what we're doing, but we just say, we're building this thing, here's our goal, what do you think, any feedback? And you know, a lot of, if you're doing it right, like I think people really take well to it, and then it does convert into some sales, which then if they have a good experience, they go back and post as customers, and then it can start, can start a flywheel if you've done a good enough job. Awesome, well, JT, thank you so much for being here, that was really, uh, I think inspiring uh, to, to kind of understand your journey a little bit. Thank you again for agreeing to stay through April. Um, uh, we're excited to have you in the ecosystem here and to be interacting more. So 
How's about a round of applause for, for JT? Thank you.